All you really, really need is a reliable canoe, enough food, enough water, a paddle, and I would encourage people to bring a second one because if you break one, you're, you're in deep trouble. How far would you go to honor a loved one who has died? Would you negotiate the distance of four rivers through the wilderness of two countries, one province, and 13 states? Would you dedicate your life to a cause? My name is Dominic Liberon. I'm from Canada, and I canoed from Canada to New Orleans over a period of eight months to take my uncle's ashes there after he passed away of a heart attack when he was only 42 years old. With over 6.5 million paddle strokes, over 3,300 miles through unpredictable weather and unrelenting obstacles, Dominic Liberon canoed from Saskatchewan to the Gulf of Mexico to honor the life of his uncle Mitch. This is a story of love. It's a tale of the courage, devotion, and resilience of the human spirit in the dance with our mortality. It's about the process of healing from a broken heart after a loss so deep it could have held the deepest rivers. How far would you go to honor the memory of someone you love? Please join me in Season 2, Episode 15, Ashes on the Great Water. From the Jones Story Company, this is The Adventures of Memento Mori, a cynic's guide for learning to live by remembering to die. The podcast that explores mortality. Here's your host, D.S. Moss. Bonsoir et bienvenue à Ciné Musique. Non, je m'excuse, c'est le temps de Mardi Gras Mambo. In 1992, my uncle Mitch visited New Orleans with a friend of his, and while he was there, he discovered the music of New Orleans, and he discovered the food of New Orleans. And when he got back to Canada, he started a Cajun catering company, and he also started... Uh, radio show, him and Camille Bolin, who was his friend that, uh, that went down to New Orleans with them, they started hosting a radio show and they shared Cajun and Zydeco music. And this is all coming from just one visit to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, that's right. One trip, 1992. He found a lot of cultural similarities between Cajun culture and rural Louisiana and the French Canadian culture that he came from. So that's an appreciation of good food, good music and, and partying and just having a good time. New Orleans left an indelible mark on Uncle Mitch and Uncle Mitch left an indelible mark on Dominic. Did, did your Uncle Mitch give any instruction? Did he talk about if and when he died, this is where he, he wants his ashes to be spread? Was there any conversation of that at all? Sort of. Like, my uncle would talk about death, but as far as last instructions, no. And part of that was because, like, he died very suddenly. Mitch died of a heart attack at the age of 42. And like most 42-year-olds, he had no reason to think about preparing his last wishes. So no, like he never said, you know, hey, uh, I need you to do this for me. Or, you know, if, if you could, would you be able to take my ashes to New Orleans? Like there was never any discussion of that. It was just something I thought would, would be appropriate because of the role that he played in my life. Like he was more like my big brother than my uncle. So it was a way for me to say thank you. But why not just fly with the ashes or drive the scenic route down? Why canoe? alone for 3,300 miles and risk losing the ashes along the way. Well, <laughs> it would have been a lot easier that way, that's for sure. Um, well, good question. So there were a few reasons. I had read a book when I was in high school called Paddle to the Amazon, and it's the true story of two guys from Winnipeg who canoed all the way to Brazil. And when I read that book, it literally... Uh, changed the rest of my life. It's, there's no other book that's Im impacted me so much. And it 
set a fire in my imagination. And I thought, wow, what an amazing experience that would be to do a long distance canoe trip. At the time of Mitch's death, Dominic lived alongside of a creek. One day, soon after the funeral, he was sitting along the banks, losing himself in the flow of the current. Then it occurred to him that the water of this creek joined the Frenchman River. And the Frenchman, unlike every other river in Canada, was a part of the Gulf of Mexico watershed, meaning it flowed south. And maybe if one took the Frenchman, they could get to the Milk River. And if you could get to the Milk River, you could get to the Missouri River. And from there, you definitely could get to the Mississippi and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. After about a year, I remember I was laying in bed and I looked up at the ceiling and I thought, there's nothing better that I could do. Like, there's no better way to spend my time than to take my uncle's ashes to New Orleans. In that moment, not only did he decide to commemorate his uncle with the trip, he also decided to use the voyage to raise awareness for heart disease. It's sort of hard to explain how special my uncle was if you never met him, but he was a very charismatic, very caring person, great uncle. And it's, uh, it's just such a waste that someone would die at 42 and so, so needless. And so what I wanted to do is, is encourage people to take the health of their heart seriously and for them to understand what the consequences are if they don't. So what I wanted to do is take the pain of death and turn it into a creative force that would encourage life. And what I mean by that is I wanted to take the pain, grief, sadness that I felt and channel that into a creative endeavor, which was my canoe trip, which was a way to raise awareness about heart disease. And so basically what I wanted to do is take death's power away as much as I could and use it as a way to encourage people to to stay alive and, and to not die from preventable heart disease. For the next six months, Dominic planned every last detail of the trip. And preparing for a trip of this magnitude wasn't easy. First, he had to map the route with little information to go on, because this would be the first ever recorded canoe trip from Saskatchewan to New Orleans. Then, there was figuring out what gear he'd need to sustain himself for eight months living out of a canoe. Then there was a lot of training, like physical training to get ready for the trip. So I got myself into probably the best shape of my life and did a lot of boxing and hockey and CrossFit and was, yeah, like physically I wanted to be ready for the challenges of the trip. So that was a big part of it as well. I felt such a tremendous sense of purpose and motivation and energy. It was just an incredible high. I I felt amazing. It was a lot of work. It was, way, like I said, it was way more work than I ever thought, but it never felt like work. It was, it was very, very enjoyable. You know, I can't help but wonder if I could spend a year and a half of my life dedicated to something with such a singular focus, to embark on a journey motivated by purpose, relying on instincts and trusting the path to reveal itself, because no one has traveled it before. If that sounds like foreshadowing, well, that's because it is. Dominic LeBron's voyage, however, begins after this. Hello, fellow provocateurs that believe death is a topic worth talking about. We need your help spreading the word. Be the slightly odd yet endlessly fascinating conversationalist at your next party and tell your friends about the adventures of Memento Mori. Have show ideas? Contact us on our site, remembertodie.com. Be sure to stay up to date with the quest for enlightenment on Instagram and Twitter by following at Remember to Die. And now, back to the show. All right, merci beaucoup, beau soleil. Et puis ça, c'était la tune, la danse de la vie, la première track de l'album, encore, encore, The Best of Beau Soleil. Alors, on y va uh, de l'album. With his gear loaded in the 18-foot canoe, Dominic, with the ashes of his uncle Mitch, pushed off into the current of the Frenchman River 
heading southbound. Okay, so let's go, let's maybe just walk through the trip because, I mean, I gotta imagine you're, you're not just in like class one rivers, you're, you're probably hitting class three and fours, no? You know, for the most part, the route that I took, there was no white water. The challenge isn't so much rapids. The challenge, I would say there's two. One would be the meandering, especially in the early rivers, like the Frenchman and the Milk River. There's a lot of just going back and forth, back and forth, and it's, it's very time consuming. The early rivers zigzag like a drunk two-year-old on an Etch-a-Sketch and often didn't have enough water in them to actually canoe, resulting in more hiking than paddling. Um, and then the other challenge, and I would say this is the probably the biggest challenge, especially from a mental point of view, is the wind in Montana and the Dakotas. The wind rolling through the prairies was an unrelenting enemy for hundreds of miles, constantly testing his determination and skill. Like on one day in Lake Sakakawea, a reservoir of the Missouri River, ocean-sized whitecap swells crashed all around him. There was one wave in particular that picked up my boat like it was nothing and rolled it onto its side. And I remember like trying to lean in the opposite direction to counter it. And I reached a point where like I couldn't lean over anymore. And I looked down and the water was right, right there. And I was pretty sure that I was gonna go, uh, go for a swim. And what scared me the most actually wasn't ending up in the water. It's that if I fell in the water, I knew the wind would blow my canoe away. And my uncle's ashes were in the canoe and, and I couldn't lose those. With a gracious gust of wind in his favor, he righted the canoe. Undeterred, the intrepid Canadian kept paddling. He paddled through lonely nights and exhausting days. He paddled through rain, snow, tornadoes, and an armed Nebraskan landowner threatening to use him as target practice. Was there at any point where you thought to yourself, I'm done? Done as in dead or done as in I quit? Done as in I quit. Oh, no, never, never. I couldn't because... I, if I quit, I would have been quitting my uncle. And that was, that was not acceptable. That was not an option for me. And actually, I remember on my trip thinking, like, what would it take to get me to stop? And the only answer I could come up with was death. So even if someone stole my canoe, even if I got hurt, I'd find a way past those obstacles to, to reach my goal. Beyond the challenges... Dominic saw the natural beauty of the North American landscape like very few others have seen. From cypress hills and dense cottonwood groves to ruggedly carved valley walls and southern bayous, some of which seemed untouched by man. There were places, especially in Montana and the Dakotas, that um, they were as untouched as they could be in the modern world. And really the only thing missing from what they would have looked like 200 years ago would have been some buffalo. And it is here where this episode gets unexpectedly blown off course. One evening, just as the sun was setting over the Missouri River, Dominic noticed a man-made structure on the shoreline set against an otherwise pristine prairie landscape. So it's basically where North Dakota and South Dakota meet, and it's on the west side of the river. And I would say it's within about six or seven miles of the North Dakota border and it's on an Indian reservation. Having no dinner plans for the evening, Dominic decided to paddle to the shore and inspect. So basically, it looks like an igloo made out of stone, except that the entrance isn't short. Like the short, the, an igloo, the, the entrance is maybe only two or three feet long. This would have been about 15 or 20 feet long. And you enter standing up at ground level, and slowly you descend into the earth, into the womb. It has that rounded shape. When you go inside, it's very, very dark, obviously, and it appears to be totally, totally pitch black when you enter from outside because your eyes aren't used to the darkness. And you have to stay in there for a while, which is a little bit creepy, actually, because your instincts want to tell you that there's rattlesnakes or demons living inside because it's dark and you can't see anything. But slowly you realize that there's, four or five holes that were left in the roof to allow light in. And then eventually you realize that there's an altar inside, very close to the ground. So a couple of episodes ago, 
I went to the Monroe Institute to induce a near-death experience. Ultimately, I left underwhelmed, but I did have an incredibly vivid meditation in which we were guided to find our spirit guides. Mine was this rock structure, some sort of dome, and i um, sitting inside on the ground in front of a small table. Rock structure? Dome? Small table? The location I went to in the meditation to meet my spirit guide sounds exactly like the structure Dominic found in South Dakota. Now, normally I would welcome it as an interesting similarity, except for stuccoed in the rocks above the entrance was a Latin phrase pieced together with broken blue and white tiles, and it read, Memento Mori. There was a certain reverence to animals. There were Christian themes. There were American themes. And so that was another thing that made it very interesting was not only the fusion of cultures, of languages, but also the fusion of spirituality. I have to admit, this absurdly fantastic coincidence has me questioning my disbelief in destiny. Typically, I believe that the outside forces that shape our lives don't happen for a reason. There's no supernatural force making sure that you forgot your parasol making you late to board the Titanic. You just forgot your parasol and the captain somehow didn't see that giant fucking iceberg. Things happen, and in order for us to make sense of it, we create a reason out of it. But I mean, come on. It has memento mori on the entrance. Is this a case of serendipity? One happy outcome out of an infinite web of possibilities? Yeah, I could buy that. Is it a mixture of confirmation bias, projection, and imagination because deep down I want this to have supernatural meaning? More than likely. Is my curiosity peaked enough to go find this place myself? Absolutely. Do you consider yourself a fan of podcasts? Show it by donating to the Adventures of Memento Mori. Donate $10 or more and we'll mail you a surprise Memento Mori keepsake. $100 or more will give you a post-credit shout-out to let the world know how much you mean to us. Go to remembertodie.com slash donate. That's remembertodie.com slash donate. On se laisse avec beau soleil, Madame Sosten. Merci beaucoup, les amis. Bonsoir et à la semaine prochaine. Bye-bye. So you're done, you, you roll up, and now you have your uncle's ashes with you. Did you know where to spread them? Or what was, what was your thought process in, okay, now I'm here, what do I do? When I left the trip, left for the trip, my intention was to find a place in New Orleans to leave my uncle's ashes. But basically what had happened is once I got to about St. Louis, and I'd meet people along the river and tell them about my trip, they started telling me about the crew of St. Anne. And once I found out about the crew of St. Anne, I realized that, man, like that's just the perfect way to, to honor my uncle's life. With a stroke of good timing, Dominic arrived for Mardi Gras. And if that weren't enough serendipity for one adventure, the first person he met in New Orleans was none other than Claire Sargenti, yoga teacher, ghost tour guide, and member of the crew of St. Anne. And what was a really cool coincidence is that the parade ends on a set of wooden stairs that goes into the river just in front of Jackson Square, the French Quarter. And um, that just so happens to be the best place to take a canoe out of the river in New Orleans. So that's where my canoe trip ended. So I thought it was really a, a cool coincidence that the stairs where I ended the canoe trip were also the stairs where I spread my uncle's ashes into uh, the Mississippi River and thanked him for everything that he did for me. In addition to honoring his uncle on this journey, Dominic also wanted to raise awareness of the importance of maintaining a healthy heart. 
my beliefs caused a lot of friction in my family because I believe that my uncle's death was preventable and a lot of people don't want to believe that like I want a lot of people don't believe in responsibility like they think it's easier to just blame it on like hereditary factors which aren't true they want to blame it on oh it just happened but that's not the reality the reality is if you spend you know 25 years of your life you know living an unhealthy lifestyle from a cardiovascular point of view it will catch up with you and my thinking is that if someone of my uncle's importance and charisma can be saved, like someone like my uncle and someone else's family could be saved, it would be worth it. You know, like these people don't need to die. Why do you think people don't take responsibility for their own health? Why, why do you think people deflect that to, to other causalities? I think because it's easy. I think because denial is the strongest drive for humans, far stronger than sex. I think sex is a weak second compared to denial. I think because people don't understand how powerful it is to be responsible. And uh, I would say it's not just about their mortality or their health. I think people will just avoid responsibility in general because that's the easy thing to do. The statistics are alarming. According to the Center for Disease Control, heart disease is the leading cause of death in America. A person dies from heart disease every 37 seconds. One out of every four people listening right now will die from heart disease. And the overwhelming majority of cases are preventable through healthier lifestyle choices. And I think what one of the other problems is, is that people think that their, their life or their health is theirs exclusively. So you could die suddenly like my uncle. And it's not just you that suffers. That's the problem that I have with that kind of thinking is that if someone dies needlessly from heart disease, there's a very strong likelihood that they'll leave behind people who will miss them potentially for the rest of their life. So we don't just live for us. It's not just our life. We also share our life with other people. And so I think once people understand that, that would help them to, to be more accountable for the health of their heart. I'm an uncle and admittedly have never considered how the consequences of some of my more unhealthy lifestyle decisions would affect my nieces and nephew. But to be fair, I guarantee you my nieces and nephew wouldn't even canoe my ashes across the East River, let alone 3,000 miles. So maybe there's an opportunity for growth. Dominic does make an interesting point, though. On one hand, I absolutely believe in individual agency and autonomy. We should be able to do with our lives how we see fit, particularly when it comes to our own bodies. On the other hand, I also believe that as individuals, we should, as Dominic suggests, take more responsibility for our health and how our actions affect our family and communities. Because after all, our hearts belong to more than just us. 6.5 million paddle strokes. That's a lot of time to be sitting with your thoughts. So I asked Dominic if during his time he had any moments of enlightenment that he would like to share. One of the things that I realized on my canoe trip because I had so much time to think is that essentially that's all life is, is time. And the question that I think people should ask themselves is, how do you want to spend that time? Who do you want to spend that time with? And um, I think once you realize that, and I think once you realize that we only have borrowed time, I think that's motivating. And I think that encourages people to, for example, take the trip that they've always dreamed of taking or, you know, starting to lose weight or eating health, you know, eating in a more healthy manner. I think that once you have, like I said, once you have a taste of that once, then it, you apply it to the rest of your life or to other parts of your life. We are all on borrowed time. What elevates this out of the realm of cliche is the practice. It's the action taken from that recognition. And it's not easy, trust me. Even with a podcast on it, I often find myself spending time on things 
that don't really matter. I'm older than Uncle Mitch was when he died, and for me, his story is a touchstone for remembering that life can always turn on a dime, and that time is the most valuable thing we possess. How we spend it is what matters most. Dominic shared one more insight he had. Everyone has at least one big thing that they'd like to do. You know, like in my case, it was to take a big trip. And, and it took me a year to fully commit to that idea. And what I would say is that once you start working on your dream, passion is rewarded. And for whatever reason, and I can't explain this, but once you start working on what you love, Things work themselves out. And if that sounds like foreshadowing, well, that's because it is. Thanks for joining me on another episode of The Adventures of Memento Mori. Thank you, Dominic Liberone, for sharing your story and the legacy of Uncle Mitch. To support Dominic in his cause for healthy hearts, please go to canoe2neworleans.com or Ashes on the Great Water to buy his book, by the same name. Or just go to our site, rememberto.die.com. I am DS Moss, back again next time as I head to the Dakotas to find the Memento Mori Cave. The episode was produced by Josh Heilbronner, D.S. Moss, and Hannah Beal. Theme music composed by Mikey Ballou. This has been a production of the Jones Story Company. Until the next time, remember to die.